Most people outside Japan have never heard of this ritual, but it was one of the most important things that happened at a Japanese banquet. So hold on to your chopsticks and let me tell you how Japanese chefs just demolished fish and shaped them into kick-ass meat sculptures, and at the same time saved people from endless suffering. It was called Hocho Shiki, or Shiki Bocho, which meant knife ceremony. Japanese nobles could be quite snobbish, and sometimes they would gather, mostly to remind each other of how awfully noble they were. These elite parties had all kinds of upper-class entertainment, like dancing, music, and yes, knife ceremonies. Now, if you're looking at the historical records, it can be hard to tell if a little meetup was actually an elite party. But one approach is to look at the guest list. If you don't see your name, it was probably an elite party. Chefs first wrote how-to manuals on knife ceremonies starting in the late 1400s, but they had been doing them since ancient times. These men were not your average chef. Elites only hired the best, each one a Gordon Ramsay in an uncircumcised hat. They were called Ho-Cho-Nin, men of the carving knife. When the Japanese get into something, they go deep without protection, like game shows. The Ho-Cho-Nin had whole schools of cooking, complete with their own secret manuals and teachings. Ho-Cho-Nin families passed down their skills like genetic diseases over generations, serving emperors and shoguns. Like samurai houses, cooking houses traced their ancestors back to legendary ancient clans like the Fujiwara, who famously married their daughters into the imperial family, allowing them control over the Heian court for 200 years. You could call Ho Cho Nin the only professional chefs for most of Japanese history, because it wasn't until the mid-1600s that restaurants served meals bigger than little snacks. Now I want you to make like a camera and picture this. A typical knife ceremony. It starts with a Ho Cho Nin in formal clothing, entering the room accompanied by his self-importance. He sits behind a ceremonial cutting board, also called a table, and the guests pause reciting their emo poetry. On the cutting board is a fresh, dead animal. The oldest knife manual tells us what people thought were the best foods. Seafood was king, then river food, its less accomplished but still friendly cousin, and mountain food was the uncle you didn't let near the kids. Mountain food was the worst, it just meant food from the land, which also included birds, so I guess it meant food not from the water. So most of the time they used fish, but sometimes large birds made the cut too. If a bird was caught by hawking, no, hawking, it could end up on the cutting board. Bigger beasts like deer or boar were definitely off the table because they were mountain foods. But also, it's probably hard to slice up a deer on that table. The most valuable fish to carve, the only one that could be cut in front of the emperor, was carp. Carp was special, because there's a Chinese legend that if a carp jumped over this one waterfall, it would become a dragon. The knife master holds a long knife and long metal chopsticks, the only things allowed to touch the fish. He opens by doing some hand and body movements like forms in martial arts, while traditional music plays in the background. And when the beat drops, that blade starts dancing ugly all over the fish, and from that madness emerges a work of art, which is often where great works of art emerge from. Afterwards, people would look at the display and say things like, Indeed, the arrangement of the fish head is a metaphor for life, and other profound gibberish. Each display had a meaning. One book had drawings of 47 different ways to cut carp, with names like departing for battle carp, probably for when someone's going to war, taking a bride carp, probably for when someone's getting married, and dealing with carpal tunnel, probably for when a chef is overworked. The founder of the famous Sono house was this knife genius named Fujiwara Motofuji. Rumor had it that he could carve a fish differently every day for a hundred days. Fish often use him when parenting. Pearl, you better eat your kelp or the Motofuji will get you. No, not the Motofuji. He's starting a new sushi roll. Ah! The fish art was kept on display for the rest of the banquet and not eaten at all. Now maybe after the party, the kitchen crew would toss it into a soup or take it home, but the banquet guests did not eat it. This was food you tasted with your eyes. It also had magical and holy properties. Different parts of the fish were magical, like one fin was called the child prevention fin, and you were definitely not supposed to leave that on display at a marriage celebration. A historian would have an interesting career specializing in the magical parts of fish, because he would be pursuing many fascinating side jobs to survive once he discovered that most of these Ho Cho Nin teachings were not written down on paper, but passed down by word of mouth from master to student. Not much available to research. 
Now, if you know anything about the Japanese back then, you might be shocked that they were okay with all of this animal killing. They were Buddhists, and good, decent Japanese Buddhists were supposed to live in fear of having lava poured down their butts. You see, one of the rules of Buddhism was thou shalt not kill or dine on Nemo. Eating too much animal gained you heaps of bad karma and could land you in one of the Buddhist hells. There was also this Shinto idea that blood and death were icky. Luckily, the ceremony cleansed all the bad karma from killing and eating animals. It also saved the spirit of the animal. They were so lucky that this was what the ceremony did. It was good for the animal because one of the main ways to enter the Pure Land Buddhist paradise was to repeat the special phrase Namu Amida Buts. Since this was beyond the capabilities of the average carp, the ceremony was the only way they could enter paradise. Once the animal's spirit left, only its useless body remained, allowing the chef to go all Picasso on that meat without Buddha getting pissed. The ritual was also a get-out-of-hell-free card for the guests, granting them permission to eat meat without taking one drop of lava in their butts. Everything the chef used, all his tools and even the cutting board, were created to hold Buddhist powers like they were sacred objects. How? Well, when crafting Ho Cho Nin equipment, every part was made with Buddhist meaning. The wooden chopstick handles were four sun in length, which showed respect to the four heavenly kings, protectors of the four directions. The metal part measured one shaku eight bu, representing the 108 temptations, life's annoying pop-up ads blocking your view of enlightenment. It also had 36 notches, which represented the 8 volumes and 28 sections of the Lotus Sutra, one of the most sacred texts in Buddhism. The knife measured 8 sun for this 8-character Buddhist phrase, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. The knife was like a wand that summoned divinities. Even the cutting board had supernatural forces. Its corners and the center had divine meaning. One text said that it was a manifestation of the Buddhist paradise. The length plus width added up to 48 sun, which represented the 48 vows of Amida Buddha, who I'm sure appreciated it when he measured the table. Its perimeter measured 9 shaku 6 sun, representing the 9 types of rebirth in Pure Land Buddhism, and the 6 words of that sacred phrase Namu Amida Buts. The table was 3 sun thick for the 3 Pure Land scriptures, and its legs added up to 8 sun for the 8 petals of the lotus. The holy board of cutting gave off so much Buddhist energy that the Buddhist energy packed his bags, flew to heaven, and smacked Jesus in the head. Knife ceremonies were not just cool to watch, but shielded guests from the bad karma of munching on meat. Accumulate enough bad karma and you could go to hell. And Buddhist hells were no joke, especially my favorite, the hell of the flaming cock. Click here to learn about that and all the other lovely hells. We have a new emperor on Patreon today, Keiko Bang. Thank you so much. We also have some regular regular patrons, Roberto Chirino III, Sam Wolf, Petals in Her Hair, ah, get him off, and Will McElhaney. Thank you so much. Alright, I love you, and spread the knowledge.